Good morning, friend. Hope you're doing well. It's dark outside. It's uh, it's actually 7 o'clock in the morning, but it's really 6 because we had daylight savings last night. Um, there's a crazy rain and wind storm happening. You're probably going to hear, sounds like a pressure washer on the window outside my office. It's just a nutty storm. I've been trying to wait to record this because it's been so loud outside. So you may hear it sound like we're driving through a car wash. If you hear that, sorry, can't stop the rain. Hope Mind Change March is going well for you. It's been a bit of a struggle for us, as I've told you, but we are doing great and going to have a wonderful Sunday here. Um, just as a, uh, in case you were confused by this or in case you haven't seen it yet, I uploaded episode 13 a few days ago, Settle Your Hobson's Choices, and somehow I managed to connect the wrong audio file to that episode. So if you listened, if you read the show notes and you were thinking it was going to be about Hobson's Choices, and then you listen to the episode, and it wasn't. That might have been a little confusing. Um, I fixed that, but in fixing it, I didn't realize that the other one kind of became completely unavailable. I started getting emails and comments from people saying, hey, that episode actually was really helping me, and now I want it and can't find it. So (laughs) turns out the one I connected uh, to episode 13 was actually the old audio file from episode 3 of the Dr. Lee Warren podcast. I have put that back online. Um... So it's uh, wlewarnmd.com slash episode 03. wlewarnmd.com slash episode 03 will get you to that episode of the podcast. And so um, that was actually called What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. Um, but if you haven't heard Settle Your Hobson's Choices, or if you heard it and it was confusing, then you need to go listen to it. That, that one's up correctly now, especially on Podbean. Check it out. Episode 13, Settle Your Hobson's Choices. I think the devil was messing with me. Um, somebody needed to hear that, and maybe somebody else needed to hear the one I actually actually put up. So we're, it's okay now. It's all fixed, and I'll be a little bit more careful about that in the future. Um, but check it out, wlewarnmd.com slash episode 03 if you're looking for what to do when you don't know what to do. It's, a, it's a, basically an episode about grief and hardship and hard times and what to do when you don't feel like you have any answers. Um, and then Settle Your Hobson's Choices is about uh, understanding that life is hard, but you can be happy anyway and how to settle those things in your life that are keeping you from finding that breakthrough moment and moving forward. So they're both two very valuable episodes. Today, um, I'm going to tell you a story, a couple of stories actually, from one from a couple from my childhood and one from recently, and connect them together. And in order to get you to the place I need to get you to, I'm going to talk a lot about my path as a, a writer, speaker, author, surgeon, and, and sort of the, the platform that I have and, and how that developed. And so it's it, it's going to sound like I'm talking about myself a lot, but but I'm talking about spiritual gifts, how we use them, and how other people can influence our ability to see where God wants us to be in our life and what we're supposed to do with those things that God has called us to. So um, kind of a long story, but I know you trust me or you wouldn't be here, so I'm going to use myself as an example of something that I think is going to help you. And we're going to talk about plaid pants preachers, church abuse, the value of listening and finding your platform and your purpose in the world. And as always, we're going to start today. Hey, I'm so glad to have you listening. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I live in very rainy and windy Nebraska today in the United States of America with my beautiful, brilliant wife, Lisa Warren, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get that done. You can get the show notes and more on my website at w1md.com, and please go to w1md.com slash newsletter to connect to this great community of people all over the world. We're coming soon with the Infinitely Happier app. You won't find it. You won't be invited to it if you're not connected to the newsletter, w1md.com slash newsletter. Check it out. Hey, if you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss an episode. My favorite place to listen to podcasts is on Podbean. You can go to drleewarren.podbean.com and check out all the great things about Podbean, including the opportunity to become a patron of the show. This is a listener-supported show, and if you like it, check it out, Podbean, drleewarren.podbean.com. Hey, I'm Dr. Lee Warren. We're here to change our minds so we can change our lives. We're going to talk about plaid pants preachers today. You're going to enjoy that, I hope. Let's get after it. Okay, when I was a kid, small town, Oklahoma, 
we had a youth minister and a preacher. I can still see this guy in my in my mind right now. He's a, got red plaid pants on, a cream colored short sleeve dress shirt, a tie that's way too short and way too wide. And the preacher and the youth minister called me into their office. When I was about sixteen, maybe fifteen or sixteen, and they asked me what I was going to do with my life. And I said, "Well, I've always, uh, since I was a little kid, I've always just had this strong sense that I was going to be a doctor." And so I'm going to go to college, and I'm going to become a doctor. And they said, well, we think that you're supposed to be a preacher. And and not just a preacher, but we think you're supposed to not go to college. You're supposed to go to this particular school of preaching. I'm not going to name it. But this this school that teaches you how to be a preacher in our church, and that you are going to go to hell if you don't do that. They literally said that to me, that they believed that I was a gifted, would be a gifted preacher, and that I would burn in hell forever if I didn't go to this particular school and become a preacher in that church. Now, as you might imagine, uh, as a child, to be told something of that uh, nature, to that power, by people that you respected and you were underneath their authority, that was quite um, troubling for me. This idea that if I didn't listen to them and, and didn't cha- abandon my idea for what I wanted to do with my life and follow what they said, that I was going to go to hell. Now, our church had a lot of great people. This is not a story about the church I grew up in. This is a story about two people who did something wrong. We were in a denomination, um, although they didn't call themselves a denomination because they thought they were the true church, and lots of churches do that, by the way. Um, there are many, many groups of Christians who think they're the only ones that have it figured out. So again, this is not a story about the church I grew up in. This is a church story about two people. But there were a lot of people that had a strong sense that they had God's will figured out. And they often applied that sense to that they had figured out what God's will for you was, what God's will for me was. And that type of Christian, um, that type of person, often preaches a strong doctrine that's based on works. Now, if you don't know what that means, if you're not kind of plugged into um, some of the old school Christian verbiage, um, there's basically kind of a division in Christendom um, where there's some groups that teach this doctrine that's that you're saved by grace and grace alone, that nothing that you do can add to your salvation, that Jesus did all that work on the cross, and all you have to do is accept him, and you're saved, and and it's done. And then there's another group that says, well, yeah, we do, salvation comes from God, and it's a gift by grace, but we have to earn it some. We have to do works, we have to do good things, we have to do good stuff, and and earn our our place in the kingdom. So there's this group that believes that, that it's works plus, or, you know, grace plus, and another group that it's just grace. And so our group was kind of squarely in that more uh, legal legalism rules following do works kind of category uh, early on in my life and that's that's changed now for that group fortunately um, but but really a strong kind of works based doctrine so sometimes um, you would have people like these two preachers that thought they had it figured out thought they knew what you were supposed to do um, and they would kind of apply this if you don't do it the way I see it then you're going to go to hell I even had a, a, another person who I revered um, who I really looked up to me, um, scold me one time after I gave a little mini sermon at church on a Wednesday night. We had a, an amazing um, little program that uh, I hadn't thought about it in years, but when I was thinking about this episode, I realized there was a thing called Timothy class. And of course, Timothy was a young man that the Apostle Paul took under his wing, and, and Timothy became a great preacher and all of that. So we had this class where the, the preacher would spend time with the young boys and teach us how to prepare lessons and how to present messages and, and basically taught us how to do couple of things. Number one, study the Bible and turn it into life lessons. And number two, to be comfortable with public speaking. And so my parents had the wisdom to make sure I got this training and the, and the church provided this really, really great training. And I bet you, in fact, I'm certain of it now, that that had a lot to do with my success in the areas of public speaking and teaching. And so my comfort level, people, people have written in since my appearance uh, at the church in, in Bonita Springs, you know, and this, this, this amazing opportunity to be at that First Presbyterian Church in Bonita Springs recently, 
and uh, you can still see it online, by the way, FPC, First Presbyterian Church, fpcbonita.org slash Warren, fpcbonita.org slash Warren, if you missed it. Um, and people say, have written in and say, how are you so comfortable on stage? Like people especially who just know me in my medical life that, that haven't really been, uh, you know, into my books or any of that, say, how in the world are you so comfortable on the stage speaking in a big event like that? And I think, honestly, I think Timothy Class and the preacher, Roy Risley, um, Roy Risley was the, the pastor at that time, preacher. Um, that's really where I got my comfort level at public speaking. And I'm grateful. I'm thankful for that. It was a great blessing to me and to the other young men that grew up in that. And it's amazing to me to see people who are just terrified to speak in public because they didn't get that kind of training. And I'm really glad. And by the way, I am available for public speaking. If your church or your organization would like to have me come and talk about hope or uh, the kinds of things that we talk about here on the podcast, you can contact my agent, Carissa Hayes, C Hayes, C H A Y S, at penguinrandomhouse.com. So if you're looking for something, uh, some opportunity to have more of me talking in your head uh, or to your group, you can contact Carissa at C Hayes at penguinrandomhouse.com. There. A little mini commercial for speaking. <laughs> anyway, back to my story. So at the end of Timothy class, we'd have a Wednesday night where the boys would get up in front of the whole church and give a five-minute or so lesson. Now, at first, in the early part of the of the class, you would they would basically give you something that was already written, and you would just present it so you'd learn how to, to give a talk. But then later, as you got a little bit more experienced, they would let you pick your own topic and write your own little devotional. And so... Um, I can trace all my writing, in fact, I think I can trace it all back to that. That's that's when I started the idea that I could take an idea and present it to people in written or spoken form, um, and I'm grateful for that. So, Roy Risley, if, if you're listening to this, I have no idea if, if uh, Mr. Risley listens to my podcast. I haven't seen him in years, but, but he gave me a start, and I was there because my parents thought that would be valuable training, and I'm grateful. So the first time I was asked to present something that I actually wrote, this is the story I'm going to share with you. I prayed and I searched for an encouraging verse and I found one that to me seemed perfect because here's something I'll, I don't think I've told you before. I was terrified when I was 10 or 11. I was terrified of going to hell. I would wake up in the middle of the night after a dream and I'd be in a cold sweat. I was scared to death that I was going to do something wrong and go to hell and spend my eternal destiny in hell and burn, burn in the lake of fire. I was, I was terrified of that. And I don't know if I'd heard a preacher say that or, or what happened because my parents certainly didn't talk like that. But I, I was scared to death of going to hell. And so I found a verse, and it's 1 John five thirteen, And it says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, that's a perfect little package of hope right there. He says, I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So right there in one uh, one sentence, if you believe in the name of the Son of God, you can know that you have eternal life. And that promise from John that we could know that we were saved, we could be certain of it, we could trust in it, it was exciting to me because it calmed that fear that I would go to hell. I had never heard that preached in our church before. So I gave my little mini sermon on that verse about how, hey, you don't have to be afraid anymore. If you believe in the name of the Son of God, you can know that you have eternal life. And as soon as the service was over, this gentleman who I, like I said, respected, loved, looked up to, admired, um, trusted, he pulled me aside. He He had a really mad look on his face. I'll never forget it. He actually grabbed me by the arm and pulled me aside into the hall, and he said, hey, that was dangerous. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, "You're preaching that people can know that they're saved, and they're going to get, they're going to get, they're going to get lazy, they're going to get complacent, they're going to start sinning, and they're going to think that they've already got it in the bag. And you're going, you're going to lead some people to hell because you're preaching that message. You've got to keep people a little bit nervous so that they'll work hard and make sure that they don't fall away." Now I'm going to tell you, I was confused by that. I was wounded by that. And people have written books and these days they talk about things and they call it church abuse. I've never said that before. But but that's what they're talking about. When somebody in the church, a spiritual authority figure of you of yours, directs you in a way that harms you and gives you unbiblical teaching in the name of God or covers something wrong with something that's supposed to be right, that's church abuse, okay? You have this this relationship where you're supposed to trust them and follow them and listen to what they say, and they're leading you astray. That's church abuse. And this man basically 
scolded me and gave me something that seemed directly to me to be in contradiction with Scripture. So what did I do? Well, at 11 or 12, I don't even think I told my parents about it. I may not have ever told them about it now that I think about it. But it, I was so confused, and I just internalized it, that, that when the Bible didn't say exactly what our group said that it said, that maybe I was wrong, maybe I read it wrong, and I needed to understand, I didn't get it right, and I should just stay safely in my approved lines of thinking and teaching and not venture out of them. So I did, but I took my it, it took my comfort away again. I started having the dreams again. I started being afraid of going to hell again after I thought I had a little hope. I was confused, and I was wounded, and you know what? I worried about my salvation again every single day of my life for the next 20 years until a friend gave me Philip Yancey's book, What's So Amazing About Grace. I'm not kidding. I lived in fear of going to hell, and everything I did in the name of God for the next 20 years was in the name of trying not to go to hell, and there's no peace to be found there. And so when somebody gave me What's So Amazing About Grace, that book, I changed my life, and you need to read it. It's still a timeless classic about grace and what's so amazing about it. And Philip Yancey really saved me. Um, His writing allowed me to find that I was actually saved. And I told you that for context now. So when we go back to the plaid pants preacher story that happened four or so years later, you can understand a little more the culture that I was in and why I was so vulnerable to that kind of of, uh, leadership. Now, there's a verse in Isaiah 30, 21. And it says this, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And I heard that voice since I was five years old. I I knew in my spirit that I was supposed to be a doctor when I grew up. I can't explain it. There were no doctors in my family. Well, I had an uncle, Uncle James, who was a DO, but at the time he wasn't. He hadn't even gone to school yet. Sorry, I'm drinking my black silk um, coffee. It's good coffee. Um. This was an incredibly painful and terrifying thing to me, to hear men I respected and trusted telling me that I was hearing that voice wrong, that I wasn't supposed to be a doctor, that I was supposed to go to this little country school of preaching where other plaid pants preachers could tell me how to preach to other people and tell them they were going to hell so maybe I could snatch a few of them out of the jaws of Satan. So if I didn't become a preacher that I was going to go to hell, I couldn't find that in Scripture. But I heard it from these two men that I respected and I was under their authority. So here I was again, confused and stressed and worried that I was going to hell if I didn't go to the right school or preach the right stuff. I felt like that other gentleman had made me feel shame over teaching what I thought was plain scripture. Now, fortunately, my parents were godly and discerning people. And they weren't drinking the Kool-Aid of the old plaid pants and his associate. They told me to pray about it. I I talked to them about this. I'm not sure I told them about the other deal, but I did tell them about this. And they made a good decision to help me. My parents didn't just say, well, whatever the preacher says, that's what you ought to do. Because a lot of people do that. In fact, a lot of the stuff that we hear about... about, um, you know, priests and, and pastors who abuse kids in school and in, in churches and, and all of that. It's because the parents place the authority for their children and allow those people to have too much say in what those kids do. You hear the wind out there? It's crazy. There's uh, There goes a whole bunch of cranes, too. I don't know if you can hear them. Um, crazy rainstorm wind and now 10,000 sandhill cranes going by. But anyway, my parents sat down and they said, hey, pray about it. You, you'll know. You'll know in your heart what you're supposed to do. And, you know, they would have been, I think, really happy for me to become a preacher. But they didn't twist my arm about it. They didn't drink the Kool-Aid of the old plaid pants guy and his associate. They said, pray about it. And, you know, the kingdom of God needs good doctors, too. And if I feel peace about that, then to follow through with what I'm supposed to do. They supported me. And so I listened to the still, small voice that I'd heard. And it's still inexplicable to me. Since I was five years old, I just I just knew it. I was supposed to be a doctor, so I went to college, not the school of preaching. I went to medical school. And somehow I got the one residency spot out of 400 applicants at Allegheny General that year, and I became a neurosurgeon, and I was in the military, and I went all over the world, and I did all kinds of things. And guess what? I never stopped talking about Jesus. I, I never quit understanding that, that my relationship with the Lord was the most important thing in my life. And when I had patients who were dying and they and their families needed something I couldn't give them was surgery, faith, hope, peace, joy, 
how to hold on when it's hard. I knew where to point them. And then we lost a son, and Jesus kept us alive and helped us heal and find our own faith and hope and joy again. And I felt called to write and record podcasts to help other people when they were hurting, to help them find what when they were going through their own furnace of suffering, to how to find that hope and joy and peace again. But you know what? The uh, old plaid pants preachers, they weren't done with me just yet. Before I tell you what happened, here's a word from my friend Tommy Walker. Now, you've heard me talk a lot about Tommy and what his music has meant to me. Well, here's a chance for you to hear how you can help him equip worshipers all over the world. This week's reverse commercial is from Tommy Walker Ministries. And let's hear what you have to say, Tommy. I believe, I believe, I believe. Hi, I'm Tommy Walker, and I've been a worship leader and songwriter for over 30 years. By God's amazing grace, he's allowed me to write some worship songs that have been sung in churches all over the world. In 2015, I started my own nonprofit called Tommy Walker Ministries so I could start giving away all my songs and music and worship resources. Since then, we've had people from over 80 nations download our charts and performance tracks, and we've given away over 100,000 of them now, and we're so blessed and honored to do it. We have a passion to declare the gospel through worship in a powerful way, so we're so careful to fill up our songs and our videos with God's Word. And if you're interested in becoming a partner with us, just visit TommyWalkerMinistries.org and become a one-time or monthly partner. We'd be so grateful. And let me just say God's richest blessings on you all. If you aren't already, become a passionate worshiper of the Most High God. Amen. Amen, Tommy. Listen, friend, if you're not listening to Tommy Walker's music, get on YouTube right now and just type in Tommy Walker Ministries and go to their go to their page and go to the media section and the video section and watch him and his daughters and their amazing team and worship with them for a few minutes. And if you're one of these folks that, that doesn't enjoy worship music or you don't think you enjoy worship music, check out Tommy's music. It literally saved me in some of the darkest times of my life. And I've never met Tommy face to face, but but um I'm connected to him. Lisa and I give to his ministry, and someday we're going to worship together. I'm I'm sure of it. Check out Tommy's work, and I'm so grateful that we're being that we're able to reverse sponsor him (laughs) and let him uh, share his message with you. TommyWalkerMinistries.org. Now let's get back to the story. You know, I wrote I've seen the end of you, and in that book, I laid out a lot about my faith. I didn't hide from it. It's clear, even though it was published by a big publisher, Penguin Random House. It it they allowed me to to put my faith out there. They didn't censor me. And, and I told a lot about my faith, about how, how people like Joey can find hope and peace through Jesus. And in the last chapter, I basically wrote my story of my struggle with doubt and faith and how I believe that Jesus is our only hope. I didn't, I didn't hide it. It's not sugar-coated. It's in there. And my book was chosen as the book of the year by the First Presbyterian Church in Bernadette Springs, Florida. That's a big deal. And I haven't talked a whole lot about it, but they have a, a lot of big-name speakers that come through there. And four days before I was there, Tim Tebow spoke there. So yeah, Tim Tebow, the, the Heisman Trophy winner, that Tim Tebow. So it's a, it was a big deal, a huge honor for them to choose my book and invite us there to speak. And it was a big deal. And so here's what happened. The plaid pants preachers reared their heads again. So somebody who was at that event in Florida thought it was great. They sent it to a friend of theirs. They sent the video. Again, you can get it at fpcbonita.org slash warren. They sent a link to the video to a friend of theirs. Now, this guy is a preacher, and he um, liked what I said uh, on the stage. And so he went to Amazon, bought my book, and, and read it. Well, after he read my book, he sent me an email. He was not happy with how I presented the gospel. And it, just like that gentleman had pulled me aside and scolded me when I was a kid, this guy really took me to task in an email. He said he was disappointed that in my book I didn't present the gospel accurately, according to him. Specifically, he said, I missed an opportunity to tell people that they were going to go to hell if they didn't repent of their sins and accept Jesus. He said, I should have written specifically that hell is real and that they were lost and that they would burn forever in a lake of fire if they didn't get saved immediately. He said, my book was weak and sinful, and it was sinful of me to have given, to have been given such a big platform and to have failed to take that chance to help people avoid eternal damnation. He even brought up the Revelation 3 passage about the church in Laodicea when Jesus said they were lukewarm and, and that he would rather they be cold or hot, but since they were lukewarm, he was going to spit them out of his mouth. He said that I was that type, I was presenting that type of lukewarm, watered-down 
soft message. He said, I was soft, I was sinful, and I should do better in my next book, that I was wrong to have not told people specifically about hell in the closing pages of my book. And let me tell you, as I read it, I was right back in the hall outside the sanctuary in my church as a little kid, getting scolded by that older gentleman. I was right back there to the plaid pants preacher's office. I was scared. I was hurt. I was confused. And then I prayed about it. And as I, as I was praying, I remembered something. I'm not a preacher. And Penguin Random House never would have published I've Seen the End of You if I'd ended it with Hellfire and Brimstone. Because it wasn't – my ability to get that book published was because I threaded the needle between a really strong Christian message and a message that was palatable to people who aren't looking for that sort of thing. So I was hoping, and I always hope when I present something to the public, that I can get you to a place to be willing to talk about God and listen to ideas about God without beating you over the head with it. And so that's what I did with help with I've seen the interview, and I know that it would not have been published, and you probably wouldn't be listening to this podcast right now if I came out with that type of message. But I was worried. Had I really sold out, like he said, was I really presenting a false doctrine? But 20 minutes later, Lisa and I received another email, this time from Esther in Canada, and she sent the video of her baptism. And she gave us in, our, in my book and my podcast some of the credit for turning her life back to Jesus. And the next day, another letter from a man who said he's never read the Bible in his life until we challenged our readers to do so. And he's broken his addiction to pornography and replaced it with Jesus because of my podcast and my writing. And Friday, a letter from a woman who wrote, I'm going, to give, I'm going to read you a quote from what she wrote. She said, the first steps in learning about Christianity and what makes someone a Christian started with your book. Everything you've said, I've been able to relate to so deeply and find meaning within my own life. With my patients and their families and the things you've seen, I almost felt like the entire book was about having a conversation between you, myself, and God. I've had my Samuels, my Joeys, and my Elis in my career so far. She's a nurse. And it's unbelievable how relatable what you say about them is. If this message truly gets to you, I would like to say thank you. Thank you for challenging me to think deeper about my relationship with God. Thank you for understanding what it means to have faith in something bigger than ourselves, but also in science. I have felt so lonely this past year, and I felt comfort with learning someone else in the world has felt the same way I have. However, I am sorry for the struggles you faced. Thank you for your service, your service as a fellow medical professional, and thank you for your words and how deeply relatable they have been to me. I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Listen, friend, listen. Over and over in the last week, we've received emails from people telling Lisa and me how our work is changing their lives, opening their eyes, giving them hope because it has helped them see Jesus more clearly. So here I am, struggling to write my new book, struggling with the sense of being the right person to deliver that message, and then getting this email from this pastor, from this guy who says, I'm going to hell because I'm not telling you that you're going to hell. And I realized all of a sudden Jesus is giving me email after email after email of people who are saying, hey, you're helping me. You are opening my eyes to the Lord. You're showing us the path. And so I realized the plaid pants preacher didn't get it right. I realized something. Those two preachers, by the way, the, the ones from my youth, one's dead. The other one, I think, sells used cars now. That little church is smaller than it was when I was a kid. It's not the same place, by the way. That They've had good leadership, and the Holy Spirit has done some great work in that group. And I'm so grateful for the way that I was raised. But, but, I'm, but, but I did have to tell you the story about those two guys. Neither one of them had any great and lasting impact in the kingdom of God. God because they were leading according to their own ideas and not according to the Spirit. So again, this isn't a story about a particular church, a particular denomination. It's a story about how God calls us all to His kingdom and gives us gifts that we are to use for His service. And sometimes other people think they see where you should go, but friend, you need to hear that from God. Now here's what I know. If I had listened to those plaid pants preachers, I would have squandered a bunch of the gifts that God gave to me. Now, I recently read John Bevere's latest book, X, Multiply Your God-Given Potential. That book messed me up, and it will mess you up. It will break your head open. It will pry open your heart. It will scare you a little bit, but it's necessary. You need to read it, X, Multiply Your God-Given Potential. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. All of this stuff that happened to me in the last week, or been drug, drug up all that stuff from my childhood, all of it happened in the context of having just read John's book. It's exactly how God works, right? He puts something in your heart 
a book, a, a ministry, a podcast, put something in your life, and then he shows you a bunch of stuff in your life that that relates to and why he gave it to you at the right time. And all this happened right after I finished John's book. It was the perfect example that I had to share with you. And here it is. I'm going to talk about myself for a second, and then I'm going to tell you why it matters to you. So here's, here's something that I know. I was given the ability to become a physician and a surgeon. Not everybody's given that, right? I'm not a software engineer. You might be. I'm, I'm not, I wasn't given that gift. I'm not an um, electrical engineer. I'm not a graphic designer. You, you may have those gifts, but I don't. But I did have the ability to become a brain surgeon. Not just to save a few lives and relieve pain, though. God didn't give me those gifts because I was going to you know, change the world in the operating room. I, I was given those gifts so that when the moment was right, I could minister to people and help them find what they really need, hope, peace, faith. That when I couldn't save them from their brain cancer, I could help them find peace and hope and faith anyway. I was given the ability to speak in public, and I'm grateful to Roy Risley and my parents for Timothy class and the great footing they gave me, but I wasn't given that so I could talk about biochemistry to a bunch of nerds in labs or that I could give an inspiring TED Talk about neurosurgery and how cool it is. No, I wasn't given that gift for those purposes. I was given the, the ability to speak in public because I'm called to talk to you about how your brain is wired and how God can make it better so you can have a better life and find your way through this hard world and find Him and help others find Him too. That's why I was given the ability to talk into this microphone. And I was given the ability to write, but not to write the great American novel. I've written two really bad novels, by the way. But to use my platform and the access you give me as a physician, a veteran, a writer, to help deliver the medicine that you really need and that I really need. I was given the gift and the ability to write because I'm supposed to grapple with hard things and try to clear them up for me and for you to see a little bit more clearly. Not everybody can write. Not everybody can express themselves, and I've gotten so many letters from people saying, thank you, that what you wrote is exactly what I've been trying to articulate, and I couldn't find the words, and you gave me those words. So I was given that gift to help you point back to God, sometimes for the first time, to land on hope. Again, that's why I'm called to write. John Bevere said that we all have to realize one key thing. The gifts God gives us are not for us. They are given to us in order to help other people find God. That's it. That's why you have, if you have a gift, that gift was given to you to help you point other people towards God. And when those gifts are not used for his purposes, they never are as good or as satisfying as they could be. Now think about this for a second. You see some insanely gifted people, professional athletes, musicians, actors, movie stars, some people who have unbelievable gifts like Michael Jackson. And they might achieve world world um, changing wealth. They might achieve uh, might, might might achieve fame on levels unheard of before. Michael Jackson sold millions and millions and millions of records, but he was a miserable, sad person because he wasn't using his gifts to honor God. I'm just here to tell you, like, Tommy Walker is a good example. That guy. Now I'm a I'm a fairly accomplished guitar player. I'm I'm a pretty good guitar player. Tommy Walker is an otherworldly guitar player. That guy has studied the art of making music and putting songs together, but he supplied that gift to the service of the kingdom every day of his life since he got out of high school. So he has used his gift 100% for the kingdom of God. And you know what? He's not rich and super famous. He's pretty pretty well known in the Christian music world. He's written lots of songs that you've heard. But he's not a tip of the tongue name that everybody in the street in Chicago knows because he's not a famous pop star. But you know what? He's got a beautiful family and he's serving the kingdom and he's touching lives all over the world. And yesterday I had an incredible experience where well, that I don't think I've told you this, but I was waking up in the middle of the night for a few weeks with this string of words in my head. And at first I couldn't remember where they came from. I, I, I didn't know if it was a, a new song or if it was an old song. I just I heard this. We praise your name, stand in awe of your never-ending love, love so great that it covers all my sin and shame. No greater power, there is no greater force in all the earth than the strength of your love. And I was just hearing that phrase over and over. I couldn't hear the tune. I couldn't hear anything about it. And I finally just, I Googled that phrase, and it turns out to be a Tommy Walker song that he wrote in 1991 called No Greater Love. There's no greater love than Jesus. There's no greater love than he gives. There's no greater love that frees us so deep within. So I'm just telling you, like Tommy, 
used his gift fully for the kingdom, 100% for the kingdom of God. Now, yesterday, as I was preparing, like I always do in the morning, I read my Bible, then I listen to some worship music, write Lisa's email, and then I sit down and write something else, write on my book, write a podcast, whatever. And so since I figured out what that song was, I've been playing, I've been worshiping over that song every morning. And I typed it into YouTube, and somehow I clicked on a different link than the one I've been listening to. And it turns out that song has been covered by people all over the world. It's still being covered. It was sung in the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir in January of this year. So here's a 30-year-old song that has had meaning and has given words to worshipers all over the place. That's the kind of thing that happens when you use your gift for the kingdom, friend. That's the kind of thing that happens when you use your gifts for God's purposes and not for yours. That's what John Bevere's book is about. And you need to read it. It'll bust your head open. (laughs) It will help you. Trust me. You need to read it. John Bevere's book, X. Now, because of that guy's email, I was struggling. And I need to tell you a couple of things just to clear the air a little bit about that that dude, the plaid pants preacher's email about hell. And I I just want to tell you, first of all, hell is a real place. None of us want to go there, and I don't want you to go there. And the only way you don't go there is if you trust Jesus as your Savior. There's a remarkable book by Francis Chan about how the modern culture in the church, there's a lot of people in the church these days that are teaching that hell's not a real place, that it's a metaphor, that a loving God would never send somebody to hell. But I'm I'm just here to tell you, hell is a real place. The Bible is crystal clear that there really is a place where God will not be, and some people will be there. And there's an amazing book by Francis Chan called Erasing Hell, What God Said About Eternity and the Things We've Made Up. You should read. It's, it's not an easy book to read, but it's, it's, it's a very scripturally sound book about what the Bible has to say about what happens after we die and what eternity is going to look like for people that accept God or those that don't. So check it out, Erasing Hell, What God Said About Eternity and the Things We've Made Up. So there is a real hell, and I'm, and I'm not saying that, but... I'm not called to be the guy who tells you about hell and that pounds on the pulpit and tells you to turn or burn. That's not what I'm called to. I'm called to do what Jesus did in John 4 with the woman at the well. In John 4, starting in 13 or 14, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, there's a time and a place and a person to tell you about your eternal destiny, but it's not here with me. I don't want to go to hell. And thank God, I know that I'm not going to. And I don't want you to go there either, but I have a strong sense that you would not be listening to me right now on my podcast if I came at you with that message. No, because I'm not called to do that. I'm supposed to sit knee to knee with you in the exam room of your life and look you in the eye and tell you the truth and tell you, let you tell me that you're thirsty and then tell you where you can get some better water to drink. That's all I do in my books and my podcasts and my talks. I just try to tell you, try to point you to the water that will finally satisfy your thirst, and that's Jesus. And so this whole long story that I'm telling you is for one purpose. You need to figure out, friend, what your gifts are. You need to let God tell you, and you need to use them for His purposes. If you're not finding satisfaction in your career or in your life, if you're not finding meaning and purpose in the way that you're spending your days, ask yourself if you're using your gifts to help people find the hope, the better water, or if you're just making a paycheck. If if you feel frustrated and lost and alone, and you don't know why you're even here, then try to find some way to use your life to help one other person not feel frustrated and lost and alone and tell them that you had the guts to do that because you wanted to see if Jesus would quench your thirst. There's a verse I'll leave you with it today. Exodus twenty eighteen through 21 says this, When the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance. And said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but don't have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. And the people remained at a distance, but Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. You see that, friend? When life is scary and dark and there's a storm and a fire and a flood and a pandemic and a divorce and a war and a lost child, sometimes we back off and stay away. But God is in there, too. He's in the middle of all that stuff. It's a Hobson's choice. If you back away and run away and pull back because you're afraid of the storm, you won't find God either. But Moses went forward. He went into it because he wanted to be where God was. You can't have life without the hard stuff. You can't. 
but I want you to be like Moses. I want you to draw closer. I want you to figure out that God's in there in the midst of all that, and he will use every tool. He will help you use every tool that he's given you to accomplish his purposes for your life. And when you draw close, you'll suddenly see that when you're closer to him, the storm and the fire and the wind aren't quite as scary. And that, my friend, is why I'm here. I'm help. I'm here to help you have the courage to step closer when it's hard. I'll end with a few questions. Here, have you let other people, the plaid pants preachers of your life, confuse you about your purpose? Have you used your gifts but not for God's purposes? Have you listened and been too afraid of the smoke and the fire to draw close enough to see that God's in there too? So, if if so, if the, if you've done that then it's time to tell those plaid pants preachers that their tie's too short. It's time to tell them to mind their own business, to take that you take your direction from God and from people who counsel you to seek God's plan and not theirs, like my parents did, fortunately. It's time to use those amazing gifts that you have. Because here's the problem, here's the truth. Nobody is like you. You, my friend, were fearfully and wonderfully made. You were God's idea. No matter what life has made you think, God thought of you. God crafted you in his image. He thought of the days of your life before one of them came to pass. He's noticed you. He will rise to show you compassion. He catches your tears in a bottle. He cares about you, and he made you in his image for his purpose, and he gave you a particular set of gifts that nobody else has. And he gave you a particular time and a place to live your life and put some opportunities in front of you that he expects you to use for his purposes, for some eternal purpose. He gave you a particular set of gifts and opportunities to help other people find the light and that good water that finally will satisfy their thirst. And if you're not feeling that, it's time to ask yourself how you're using your gifts. That sounds like a hard teaching, but that's the truth. If you're feeling frustrated and alone and tired and you don't know why everything is so hard, ask yourself how you've been using your gifts and help other people find out why they're supposed to be here too, why they're here too. It's time to do something different. If you've been frustrated, it's time to tell those plaid pants preachers to change clothes. Man, the style's changed, dude. It's time to go. It's time to look at your purpose, look at your life, and figure out if you've been using it for God's purposes. And you will all of a sudden find that your thirst is finally quenched and you're right where you're supposed to be. It's time to draw closer, friend. It's time to stop being afraid to go into the fight because God's going to be there with you. And guess what? It's time to start today. Hey, thanks for listening. The Dr. Lee Warren Podcast is listener-supported. Check out patron.podbean.com slash Dr. Lee Warren. Patron.podbean.com slash Dr. Lee Warren. Patrons and partners get free books, transcripts, special patron-only episodes, and more. And partners like you allow us to stay ad-free and keep growing. Hey, please subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. Check it out, drleewarren.podbean.com. That's my favorite place to listen to podcasts. Go to website, my website, wleewarnmd.com, for more information about my letter, my show, my books, and more, and add slash prayer. If you need prayer, go to the prayer wall. We've established a beautiful prayer community of people who are praying for and with each other all around the world. WLE1MD.com slash prayer. You can even post anonymously if you want to. Stay tuned for our own app. We're coming at you with the Infinitely Happier app. You will only get uh, get invited to it if you're on the newsletter. So get WLE1MD.com slash newsletter. And when the app's ready to go, you'll be the first one, along with the other folks in this community, to find out about it. So get the newsletter so you won't miss out on everything that's going on in this beautiful community wlewarnmd.com slash newsletter hey the theme music for the show is water into wine by tommy walker graciously provided for free by tommy and the good people who are changing the world at tommy walker ministries get the music for free and consider supporting tommy's great work at tommywalkerministries.org if you need prayer again go to the prayer wall wlewarnmd.com slash prayer and remember you can't change your life until you change your mind you have to start today i'm dr lee warren i'll talk to you soon god bless you friend have a great day roll out tommy